Good morning to everyone. I hope that uh, you have the word of God with you, the power, the power in our life, right? To guide us, to lead us in the ways of everlasting. And so let's go ahead and open up those Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to continue our study in verses 6 through 13. That's 6 through 13. And the title of the message this morning is, If It Wasn't for the Lord. If It Wasn't for the Lord. See, as we delve into these verses, we're going to see a spirit from, um, from Paul that is a spirit of introspection, encouraging the Corinth church to be introspective about their walk with the Lord their position with the Lord, the blessings of the Lord, just all those things that encompass being a Christian and just being really human. You know, there's no doubt that uh, as far as from a world standpoint, I always like to say that, you know, people recognize that they're blessed or that they have talents, things of that nature. But the biggest difference between the world and and I would hope Christians is that we acknowledge where those blessings and talents come from, and that's from God Almighty. The world would be led to believe that it's from self. It's uh, their own strength, their own power, their own might, their own intelligence, their, their, their own everything. And, and, and that's, not, that's not true. That's the furthest thing from the truth. No one is born with talent. No one is. We're born with breath of life we're born with opportunity some more than others depending on the, the situation of their birth but nonetheless we all start off basically in, with a clean slate all that we have as far as intellect and abilities is are things that we that we learn and they're taught to us and we absorb them whether through verbal teaching or through uh, absorption through osmosis in what we see others doing. And so Paul captures that so eloquently by bringing, by using himself and Apollos as an example regarding that. I shared last week how you know eloquent Paul is, is that he doesn't necessarily go out and start finger pointing and and calling anybody out unnecessarily because this is a a very general letter to the entire church because the entire church or that church body was in a bad position spiritually and so it was a epistle a, a, a letter to the entirety of the church as it is this morning for all of us and so instead he uses himself as an example of not just the grace of God, but also to the example of what it means to live for God and what that looks like, what that sounds like. And so he magnifies that here, beginning in verse 6, where he says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself. To myself. That's a good place to start, isn't it? You know, uh, if, if there's going to be any type of correction... Or any type of, of, you know, exhortation or teachings or bringing out or as uh, Jesus says, you know, pointing out of sin. The best place to start is self. It's right here, myself. When when you focus on self, as far as my walk, my responsibility, you know, my accountability, my contribution, all those things. That's the best place to start and you're going to see better results like that than going out there with some type of pharisaic eye to see what others are doing. And that's what Paul is is exactly, that's exactly what he's doing here. And again, this comes from personal experience because that's how Saul, now Paul, used to be. He used to be one of the Pharisees out there looking for the shortcomings of the people and then bringing it to their attention of what they're not doing, but yet, as they say, when one finger's pointing out, you have three pointing back to you, unless, of course, you had some kind of 
accident, you lost a finger, then you might only have, you know, two or maybe one. But nonetheless, you have those fingers pointing back at you, and that's where you need to begin is myself. So Paul says, for myself. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos because these are the two main leaders, right? And these are the kind of like the 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 men that that the church of Corinth is using as the cause for division for your sakes. <coughs> so he says, I'm using myself and Apollos as an example for your sakes or in other words, for your benefit. This is all beneficial because even though there's there's a slight Paul is implying slightly here and maybe not even slightly but very boldly that that the Corinth church has become very independent and I'm not talking about independent necessarily from Christ which which is more of a rebellion because when you get into the flesh that's really a rebellion but there are also two kind of dissing if you want to use a more modern term they're dissing Paul they're they're disrespecting Paul in the sense that they've become very puffed up and arrogant in themselves and forgetting their humble beginnings. That was Paul himself who brought the gospel to them in a time that they were dead in their transgressions and ignorant of truth. And yet it was Paul that was used by God to bring this marvelous truth, the gospel of grace, to them. And now they've grown bigger than the teacher, so to speak. Some of you are old enough to remember Kung Fu. Remember that? Right? <laughs> the the TV show Kung Fu. And and it was always the whole, the big part of that was the you know, snatching out of the pebble from the master's hand. And he'd say, come on, grasshopper, snatch it out. And and then he would, he would think that he was fast enough. Like, well, you know what? I've learned enough. I know enough. I'm going to be greater than the master. And then tries to snatch it. And basically is like, you ain't quick enough. You're not faster. You don't know more than the master. But in this case, Paul is saying, hey, we're the greater the servants because of our position, but we're not greater than you. But yet, nonetheless, positionally, there needs to be some type of honor due to us because of what we brought, and yet you're not doing that. And so take a look at our own lives. I'm going to use my life and Apollo's life so that you could really see and comprehend what it truly means to be a servant of Christ and all, because he's going to discuss this here shortly, all that we have gone through compared to what you have gone through and let's basically let's let's check notes here let's 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 compare each other's lives and and again paul is not trying in any way shape or form to shame the church or shame the corinth church but he's doing his best through exhortation through example to get them into the right perspective because perspective is everything when when you have the wrong perspective then you're working in self-deceit. But when you have the right perspective, the biblical perspective, the godly perspective, the Christ perspective, then you're operating in the right light, in the right manner, and you're heading in the right direction. But when your perspective is skewed, and you have a worldly perspective, a self-perspective, then you're off. And everything that you do from that, from, from that point on, everything you do is going to be off, and the result is going to be horrific, and they're not going to bear godly fruit. They're just not. It doesn't mean that God won't use it because he works all things together for good. But when you're talking about self and accountability and proper walk with the Lord, it has to be from the proper perspective, and that's the biblical perspective. That's why Paul says, we're going to use myself and Paul as an example for your benefit. For your sakes, that in us you might learn that you might learn not to exceed what is written in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. <coughs> so again, Paul points to himself because he's obedient to the word. And he's implying that when you stick to the word, you will reap godliness and not arrogance. Again, Paul uses himself and Apollos as an example of those who work also too together. Because remember, the theme here in Corinth is, is division. Throughout all the letter, this, this, this whole letter, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, 
is all about addressing the division that was in the church and the results thereof. And so in, in, this, in this verse here, Paul uses himself and his Paul as an example as what it looks like and sounds like to work together. Because remember previously he said, you know, hey, some what? Some sow seeds, others water, but ultimately who's the one who makes it grow? It's God who makes it grow. But Paul is giving these figuratively examples so that they can see it to go, oh, wow, it's true. You know what? Those two guys, those two brothers do work harmoniously together. And it's beautiful how they get along. And it's beautiful how they don't knock each other down, but yet they exhort each other up. But yet, Apollos is known as, as, the, as the eloquent one, wasn't he? Paul was, uh, Apollos was eloquent in word, and, and, and Paul wasn't. Paul was the opposite. Paul was probably the monotone guy. The, the monotone in voice and didn't have much undulation and not much excitement and you really couldn't tell if he was excited or not you know face wise features wise but yet from a theological standpoint who was greater Apollos or Paul well Paul was of course and yet Paul didn't use that to rub it in the face of, of Apollos he says no you know what there's, there's, there's a, 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 a beautiful harmony going on here when you take what Apollos has and when you take what I have and then you apply it for what? For the glory of God and you see greater work. You see greater work in that. So he says we work together. And also too, he's pointing to themselves as being individuals who thought of themselves modestly, not arrogantly. Paul was a very modest man after, <laughs> this was after the encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, after he was humbled by the Lord. Prior to that, he was a very arrogant man and, and exuded arrogance and pride. But when he became a Christian and he received the Holy Spirit and he understood from the perspective of who's greater, well, Christ crucified then he became a very humble man and, and even rolled in a very humble way. Continued to work as a tent maker, continued to be amongst the people and, and never demanded anything from anyone. And even to the point when, when he was brought before the council and, and got a little haughty, he apologized, remember? When they smacked him in the face, they said, hey, how dare you smack me in the face? And then all of a sudden when he figured out who the people were he's like well i apologize you know i take that back but yet nonetheless nonetheless and then he uh reminded them of his of his of his position as as a roman citizen and all those things and god used those things for the ministerial purposes but yet nonetheless paul became a very humble man extremely humble humble and modest In the proper perspective, or so, sorry, when you keep things in the proper perspective also, it prevents quarrels and contests, sightings, you know, or parties or, or cliques, if you might say it that way, within the church. Proper perspective, when you maintain the modesty, you eliminate that arrogance, and then you maintain the continuity, the harmony within the church. And quite frankly, that is one of uh, the main focuses that we have within the church is to be harmonious, is to have mutual respect for one another within the light of what? Humility. When we, when we maintain our humility, then we can eliminate those quarrels and those divisions because we have the right perspective. And like I said, Paul was a master at that. When, when you look at the studies or when you do a study of how he even was obedient ver from the very beginning, you know, when he came back to Jerusalem and he wanted to go because of his enthusiasm for the Lord and his newfound faith and his love for Christ and the understanding of the big picture of truth of, of, in Christ Jesus, he immediately wanted to come back and share that in the temples. And, and we know that within there in Acts, we find out that it caused trouble. It, it, it backfired, so to speak. And yet the brothers came and lovingly told him, hey, listen, Paul, 
you're you're causing more issues to the point where people are really getting upset. They want to kill you, and it's causing a riff in the community. And so they exhorted him to do what? To leave. To basically, we love you, but pack your bags and leave. Like literally, pack your bags. Not not just figuratively. Literally, pack your bags and leave. Go back to Troas. Get out of town. Hightail it out of here. You're you're causing trouble. And so he didn't say, well, how dare you, you know, again, busting out the credentials. You know, prior, prior to, to following Christ, I had this position. I, no, he just, he, he left. As a matter of fact, there's nothing that would indicate that he even offered even one ounce of resistance. The Bible just says they told him and then he left. That's it. And then we don't hear from Paul again for another 10 years. Thereabouts until Barnabas says, hey, got the great guy for, you know, the church there for the Gentile church and then uh, goes and sends for, for Paul and then he comes back onto the scene, like I said, almost 10 to 12 years later. So the humility and the modesty, not looking to be puffed up with arrogance, Paul saw that as beneficial as a, as a, as a virtue but also too as a tool as a tool in the tool chest of spiritual warfare. Now, if you're looking to, to make progress, so to speak, with the gospel, with sharing the gospel with others who don't know Christ, modesty, humility are great tools to use. Because when you come up with arrogance and say, well, you know, I'm telling you this because I know the Bible. How, how, you know, what's that, what's that going to gain you as far as in the area of trying to win them over for, to Christ? They're going to put up defenses, the automatic natural defense mechanism that says, don't you tell me what to do. I don't care what you know. Well, look at you, Mr. Know-it-all, Miss Know-it-all. Aren't you filled with yourself? You know, or all those other things that come along with it. And that's the, you know, and that's the problem with you Christians. You think you know everything and blah, blah, blah. And the, right? Versus coming in with, with modesty and, and, and humility and saying, listen, you know, I just want to share it lovingly. If you would give me even permission to do so. When was the last time you asked someone for permission to share the gospel with them? I mean, literally ask permission and say, hey, can I share something with you? Can I share what the Bible says? And, you're, and right there you're asking permission and really respecting that individual and, and looking for the invitation to share. Just again, you know, using Paul as the example, when they invited him to share there at, uh, in, in Mar- at Mars Hill, and, and he shared with them after the invitation. Now, every situation is different, but nonetheless, especially when you're talking about one-on-one ministry, ministering to an individual, someone who you're building a relationship with, you want, you want modesty, humility to go before you so that God would open up those doors to be able to pour into them, plant into them seeds and water that seed. <clears throat> Paul was a master at that. Look at verse 7. It says, For who regards you as superior? And see now, Paul has set them up, you know, look at our lives. For your benefit, for your sake, we're going to use our lives as the example. We don't go outside the bounds of the word. And, and why? For the purpose of harmony and also too for the advancement of the kingdom, for the gospel. But then he turns around back to them and he says, For who regards you as superior? And, and what, what do you have? What do you have? that you did not receive. But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Hmm. This is, this is introspective questions. Paul saying, hey, assess. Be introspective about your life. Take stock. Take inventory about your life. You know? Contemplation and introspection are key to reminding us 
if it wasn't for the Lord, who would I be? Or what would I have? Or where would I be? You know? For from Him all blessings flow. From Him all things come. He and He alone is the true master of all. We, just the stewards. That's all we are. We're just stewards. And when we lose sight of that, and we start thinking, like I said, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of the message, as the world believes that, you know, it's in our own strength, it's in our own power, it's in our own intelligence. Look how awesome we humans are. When you, when you, when you have that mindset, you, you're off the mark and you're, you're filled with self and you've basically made yourself a god. On uh, yesterday, an interesting conversation came up. I was out with a couple friends for a little ride, and and um, you know we're just talking. We're all, we're all in the sports, and we're just talking in, in in general regarding different athletes and their abilities and so on and so forth. And uh, two of us are are believers, um, a brother named Jonathan and myself, and then another uh, individual that was with us. He's he's not a believer, and and interestingly enough. The night before, I was sharing with my wife is that I was telling her, I was like, man, I'm just praying to the Lord to give me an opportunity to, to pour the gospel into him. I said, but he's a little bit on the challenging side, you know, as an individual. So I'm, I'm kind of almost like a little bit like Jonah, like not a whole hundred percent willing to do it. But yet I know deep down inside it's the right thing to do. And yet, you know, so I shared with this with, with my wife just the night before. And so following day this again this was friday night with my wife and here it is now saturday and we are riding just the two of us initially but then along the road we find jonathan who had stopped and had he not stopped obviously he wouldn't be able to join us and so now we're riding we get to our our first destination and we stop and we start to converse and as we're talking like i said sports came up and you know we're talking about uh individuals abilities and I mentioned about Romans, and, and then all of a sudden, it's like the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of Jonathan, and Jonathan starts just basically in power, just sharing about, you know, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, if it wasn't for God pouring into us, and so on and so forth. And I'm sitting there going like, wow, Lord, answered prayer. You knew, you knew my heart that I wasn't as willing to share with this individual, but yet you brought another to stand in the gap and to share powerfully who you are he says and bottom line is and he begins to share about the temple and you know how god desired to dwell with man and how the temple was eventually destroyed and we don't need the temple anymore because now we are the temple of the holy spirit and christ and dwells in us and thank god for his crucifixion and his blood and i'm saying this, and i'm looking over to my buddy right who doesn't know the lord who by the way is half jew you know and i'm going like this is awesome you know it's amazing and, and it's like, I'm looking at his face, and he's kind of like, like going like, you know, has that look in his face like, what is going on here, you know? And, and, but the point is, is that, you know, so from this, and I'm going like, wow, Lord, you know, this is a, an awesome, powerful experience here that's just totally humbling me. Because I didn't have the most willing heart to share with, with this individual, but yet you've used another brother in a very powerful way who's equipped differently, clearly, than I am to do the work that is necessary to pour into him. And yet, in, in a manner that is in line with the theme that we're talking about, and that's man's inability to confess and come clean that they need God. Because when a man gets so filled with himself that, that becomes like a little mini-God that they can't see their need beyond themselves to cry out to God in humility and in forgiveness to say, Lord, I need you. And the individual that we're using as an example was basically like Tiger Woods, how, you know, his career is kind of crashing, coming to a crashing end, but yet all he really has to do is come out and just publicly say is like, listen, man, I made some real bad mistakes in my life. I need forgiveness and I need to uh, hit a reset, you know, a restart. And, and people would be like, oh, yeah, absolutely. But instead he has to make up all these excuses and yet his career keeps going further and further down you know, down the hill. But it's contemplation and introspection that are key. And for us as Christians, who know the truth, even more so, 
Because Paul is saying, hey, Corinth Church, you know, you, you have these blessings, you have these gifts, but where did they come from? It wasn't from you. It wasn't from within. It wasn't in your own strength. It wasn't in your own power. You know, John the Baptist had a similar experience, but he was on, he was on the, I know where my blessings come from side. When, remember, his, his disciples, and this was, uh, you know, uh, his disciples caught wind there in, in, in John chapter 3. His disciples caught wind that Jesus and, and his disciples were doing what? Baptizing as well. And in water as well, because the Bible says that John was in another region baptizing in water, and it specifically says because there was a lot of water there, you know? So because if you're going to baptize, you're going to need enough to submerge someone, you know, in that watery grave. And so anyways, his disciples come and they start basically having issues. They have concerns. And they bring the report and they say, hey, John, because even they probably put John on the pedestal. They put John on pedestals like, wow, look how awesome he preaches, man. The dude eats, you know, uh, locusts. I mean, come on, he's a man's man. And yet they catch wind that Jesus is out there baptizing. And so they feel almost threatened. And it's like, well, all the attention now is going to go to Jesus and not you, John. And they bring the report. And they say, hey, this is going on. And what's John the Baptist say? He says, hey, listen, all blessings, man. All blessings, they come from heaven. In other words, I'm just but a man, and I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for God himself who's equipped me, who's equipped me to be preaching, who's equipped me to have the knowledge, who's equipped me to even have what I have. They come from heaven. Psalm 115 (coughs) says this in Psalm 115. Just in verse 1. It says, Not to us, O Lord. Not to us, O Lord. Not to us. But to thy name give glory. Because of thy loving kindness. Because of thy truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? So glory goes to the Lord, right? Not to us, but to thee, O Lord, to thee, O Lord. We have personally no reason to glory in ourselves. We really don't. I mean, if we were 100% honest, in regards to self, we have no reason to glory in ourself. We, uh, I mean, the Bible says that that uh, our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Who could say amen to that? You know, amen, right? Sign us up for that. I mean, I have at times my heart, even though it's regenerated, I still have these fleshly battles with thoughts and, and, and even actions that are just are wicked. Um, my treatment of, of even my very wife at times is despicable and, and horrendous. And yet, you know, how could I boast in self, you know? Uh, my slothfulness in serving the Lord at times is shameful, where it's like I know that God has called me to do certain things, and yet, what do I do? I put it off, right? I, I come up with reasons not to, which are, you know, a.k.a. excuses. I declare that my life is completely yours, O oh God, but yet my life is, is riddled with a lot of leisure experiences that have absolutely nothing to do with the kingdom of God. And so the list goes on and on, and yet, by His grace by his mercies I could still say that you know what I'm useful for the Lord and and yet all that I have is because of him but like I said we have no reason to glory in ourselves all glory belongs to him and quite frankly self glory is an instant humility killer isn't it 
as an instant humility killer. And glory, what's that mean? It just basically means to praise. You know, praise belongs to God and God alone. Recognizing actions, recognizing superiority, that's what giving glory is. You know, uh, I in my own strength, what can I really do? Because even the very strength comes from God and His creation. Look at verse 8. It says, Nor let us... Whoops. I jumped over to chapter 10. Verse 8. You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And I would indeed that you had become kings so that we also might reign with you. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world both to angels and to men. So Paul here begins to draw a great contrast between the life of an apostle and the elation, the elation of the Corinth church by the abundance of their wisdom and spiritual gifts. It's almost like he's being a little sarcastic here, you know? It's like you've already become this, that, and the other in your own estimation. In other words, if it was uh, in modern terms, you think you've already arrived and that you're all that. You think you're kings, you think you're this, you're, that. you're so full of self that you think you're all that. And Paul says, I wish that you really were, but that's not the case. And then again, in contrast, he says, but us, we become spectacles. We become spectacles to the world and, and also to, to angels and to men. The worst of the worst, you know? Condemned to death. Because we've become spectacles. And, and Paul here is drawing from his, from his experience of what, what was going on, especially in the Roman Colosseum. Remember, this is, he's under, uh, currently, while he's writing this, that whole region is under the Roman Empire and the Roman rule and reign. And what they used to do there in the Colosseum to bring what? To bring shame by pitting man, those that were basically enslaved, and then to combat, whether against beasts, and they're brought as spectacles. And even if you won, it didn't gain you anything. All that gained you was another day to die. Eventually, you're going to meet your demise. And yet, Paul's saying, from a spiritual term, our you know, being used as a spectacle isn't just here, you know, testifying to the horizontal but it testifies to a greater thing, the vertical, the vertical as well, to, men, to angels and to men. Put on display for all to see. So like I said, Paul, Paul draws a great contrast or begins to draw a contrast between the life of an apostle and their relation and the abundance of their own wisdom and spiritual gifts. They're so full of themselves, it reminds me so much of the church of Laodicea, there in uh, Revelation chapter 3. And beginning in verse 14, it says this, it says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. So from from. God Almighty to you, listen. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked 
So the church in Laodicea became self-deceived. In other words, they became so full of themselves that basically they said, God, we don't need you. We got it from here. We've arrived. And Paul, in his wisdom, shares the same thing with the church in, in, in Corinth. They think that they've arrived and they've neglected. They've neglected the basics of Christianity, which is humility and service to one another. Serving your fellow man. Serving your brethren as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Look at verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake. Again, referring to himself and the rest of the apostles. We are fools for Christ's sake. But, but you, you are prudent to Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty <coughs> and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. <coughs> the apostles' suffering was in direct relation for their fidelity to Christ. The apostles were the most hunted human beings. They really were. And they were exposed to great hardships. They carried their own lives in their hands. Who amongst us lives like that? <laughs> I don't. I, I'm, not, I'm not being hunted down by anybody. At least not that I know of. You know? And, and we're talking here because of my faith. Because of my faith in Jesus Christ for Christ's sake. You know? Maybe you're being hunted down for other reasons. That have nothing to do with Christ. I, I exhort you to repent from that, you know, and just own up to it. But who here amongst us are being hunted down currently because of Christ's sake? Absolutely none of us. And, and you see how Paul is beautifully making the contrast. Again, this is not to shame. Because he says that eventually in verse uh, 14. And we'll get to that next week. This is not to shame. This is basically to snap, snap them out of their spiritual slumber. They kind of like, you know, wake up, man. Wake up. Wake up. Smell the spiritual roses around you. There's so much going on, and yet you're so caught up in self. You're self-absorbed, and you've taken, off, taken your eyes off the Lord, and you're, you're doing things and caught up in things that have absolutely no benefit for the kingdom of God, and you're doing more damage than good, and you need to wake up and snap out of it. Repent from that and get right back on track on the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And, and if you think you're going through rough times, come on, man. You don't know rough. You don't know difficult. And yet, we get caught up like that. We get caught up like that. And like I said, so Paul uses those contrasts and look what he finishes saying there in verse 12. And, and we toil, working with our own hands. I mean, again, I mentioned last week that, you know, if you put a, a dollar value, if you had to put a dollar value, a monetary value of what an individual that shared the gospel with you, that brought you to Christ, was worth, what monetary value would that be? You, you know, it's priceless, right? But yet, who's worth more? <laughs> the gospel himself, the word himself, Jesus Christ. But yet... When you look at individuals who do so much for the church or for the, the body of Christ, and yet in some cases, you know, they're, they're almost set aside. And we forget all that it took for our faith to reach our hearts. And we take it for granted. We take individuals for granted. 
We take the work that was done before us for granted. And then all we focus on is right here, what's right before me. And we lose the proper perspective. It wasn't an easy life for the apostles. And we, we know the story. We know eventually that all of them but one was martyred. And it was horrific deaths. It, it wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, you know, this, okay, well, we're just going to, you know, just you know, kill you easily, you know. It's like, no, being dipped in, 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 in hot oil and then, you know, boiling their skin and hung upside down and crucified in that manner, being chopped up and Paul's head being lofted off. I mean... Uh, you know, and this was daily hunting them down, daily, 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 and this is from believers, you know, supposed believers, you know, the the Jewish sect coming down after them, and then when the world began to to be turned upside down because of the gospel, I should say right side up because of the gospel, even more so. Look at Paul being persecuted and stoned numerous times. You know, receiving the, the, the lashings and, and uh, you know, the thorn in the side. And he asked to be healed. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. You know, I don't know, I don't know what your family dynamics are like, but uh, myself personally, I love, I love hearing stories that are told from our relatives. The stories that our relatives tell. Um, I enjoy thoroughly uh, hearing the stories from my parents coming here, you know, uh, and establishing their lives here, coming from Mexico and establishing their family and all that they went through. But even going further back, hearing their lives, you know, growing up as children, uh, their, their experiences, a whole different era. You know, my dad sharing with me that, you know, uh, back in the day, you'd see someone who was basically my age, you know, 50, 51. Uh, it, that individual would already be considered a very old man. And, and literally, literally, physically just spent, you know, uh, probably with, with a cane and, and just beat up and, and close to death. And, and it still exists like that in some countries. I mean, you know, you talk about third world countries, the life expectancy drops dramatically you know like in haiti the life expectancy for a male is roughly like 45 50 max and and that's it because you know just because of the conditions and from a personal standpoint to to hear about you know my my dad's upbringing with such a large family and and all the things that they experience um you you grow a greater appreciation to say really thank you lord thank you lord god for you know placing in in our parents hearts the desire to come here and and uh, establish our lives here you know thank you lord for keeping my parents through their childhood you, you think about the potentiality of death even now you know we take even life for granted you know even driving the freeways how many of us really think about all that could go wrong while we're in the freeway most of us don't. I mean, why? Occasionally, like if someone cuts us off, oh my gosh, I almost died, right? But it isn't until that moment. But prior to that, so much could go wrong. I mean, think about you're depending on a whole bunch of individuals to stay in their own lane. And, and look, man, some of us have to own the fact we're not the best drivers in the world, you know? Some of us are the problem out there. And yet, we make it safely. How many of you made, all of us here today have actually made it safely to church? But yet, so much danger out there. So much could go wrong at any given moment. And yet, we don't give much thought to it until something goes wrong. Or, or a close call. It's like, oh, wow, you know, today I almost lost my life, you know? Because this happened. It's like, no, man, you don't even know how, much, how close you are to losing your life every day. Every day something can go horribly wrong. And we don't have that appreciation for life. Just the basics. Much less for all the blessings that come with it. And so, going back to my, my parents, specifically my dad, just recently, you know, he was sharing about, uh, you know, where, where they grew up in Tamasula, you know, 
they would go out and the big rainstorms would come and they'd have to go collect the gatherings for for the day and they'd kind of go like basically in the woods and stuff like that and he's sharing this and how his dad would send them forward send them ahead to make sure that they caught the bus because if not they'd be left behind and they'd have to walk and all this other stuff and and yet <clears throat> he eventually said something that to me was like it just like was like it floored me you know and he said it was so difficult because you know not having shoes because i didn't have shoes until i was 12 years old and i was like like wow like my dad was shoeless you know and it and it hits you hard because it's like you take like i said you take things for granted and all of a sudden you see your parents just in a whole different light you know that's like this child and how difficult life was the difficulties i can't even begin to imagine you know some of you like walking without shoes not me you know especially on a hot summer day you know going out in uh in, in in the in the pavement burns my feet or you step on something just something so simple a little pillow you're like oh, oh my gosh call 911 take me to the doctor just stepped on something you know but to hear that he didn't own a pair of shoes until he was basically 12 years old, it made me appreciate my dad that much more. Because of all that he had to go through in his life and all that God did to keep my dad to be here where I'm at today. What's that worth? And in comparison, in comparison to what I have gone through in my life, I can't compare. What can I compare in my life that would be equal or greater in suffering or difficulty than what my dad went through? I have absolutely nothing in comparison. Oh, I've gone through things, but in comparison, they don't compare. And, and Paul here, he's, he's extrapolating and saying, hey, look, in comparison, you guys are, are, are well off. Don't take it for granted and don't abuse of it. And don't become self-absorbed as a result of it. And don't let it become as a uh, be used as a division amongst you because of it. And so it's a, an appreciation. It's a comparison. And he says in verse 13, when we are slandered, we try to con consolate, sorry. When we are slandered, we try to consolate we have become, as the, in my translation, Paul says, we have become as the scum, the scum of the earth or of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. The scum. I mean, scum all of us know what scum is right scum scum is the stuff that that gathers sometimes like uh we have a faucet in the backyard that we haven't used in a long time and i needed it recently and i went i went to go turn on and the first thing i was like i even said it's like man this thing's full of scum and and what was my reaction ugh it's like, i don't want to touch the scum you don't know who wants to touch scum anybody want to volunteer to touch scum scum is nasty you know who wants, to, who wants to hang out with scum? You know? Who wants to be associated with scum? The scum of the earth. The scum of the world. Yet he says, that's who we are. We're the scum of the world. The dregs. The lowest of the low. And the eyes. And the eyes of the world. That's, that's what we are. That's who we are. And yet you can't get it right. You can't, you can't humble yourselves for the sake of continuity and, and fellowship. And mutual respect for one another because you haven't assessed that's the problem you haven't taken inventory when's the last time like I said that you sat down and said hey 
let me assess my life truly in comparison, in comparison, in comparison to the sufferings of my fellow brethren, in comparison to the, maybe the sufferings of others. And look, within the body of the believers, everyone's going to be called to different things. And Paul's not saying, hey, come join me. He's just saying, hey, put things in the right perspective. That's all he's saying. Because not all are going to be called to be considered scum of the earth. The dregs of the world, you know? Not all of us are going to be called to, you know, go to a far off land to go preach the gospel and potentially be martyred as a result of that. Not everyone's going to be called to be, you know, a minister to a difficult group of people or, or organization or, you know, uh, things of that nature. Not everyone's going to be called to be a pastor. Not everyone's going to be called to be in children. Not everyone's going to be called to work. Not everyone has a different calling on their life, but everyone has a responsibility to assess, to assess properly in the right perspective. Everybody does. And yet, and yet, when Paul, when you compare Paul's life to the life of Christ, you can't compare. You cannot compare. Paul lays out some of the particulars, like said in here in these verses in 11 through 13, some of the particulars of his sufferings. They were made as filth, or as he says here, scum of the world. But yet, no poorer, but net, you no know, poorer than his who had not referred to Christ. What did Jesus say there in Luke? Uh, I believe it was Luke 9:58. You know about himself. It was like, you know what? Foxes have holes, birds have nests, you know, and yet the Son of Man doesn't have a pillow to rest his head on. Homeless. The Son of God was homeless. Homeless. His sufferings we cannot compare to. He was, he suffered the most. He was, he experienced the most ridicule. He experienced the most abandonment than any human being can ever possibly experience. He was abandoned by everyone. Everyone. He experienced all the horrors that this fallen world can possibly dish out. All the horrors. And yet, without sin. In other words, if I was to kind of paraphrase it or put it in a different vernacular, I'd say, yes, he was dealt a bad hand in life, but yet he did not complain. And yet, he didn't treat anyone any different as a result of that. And yet, he didn't make that his focus. And yet, how many of us do that? Right here, man. We could take the smallest of things and make it seem like it's the end of the world. And make that our focus and dwell on it and give it life and, and regurgitate it and, and meditate on it and, and feel like we're a victim and all this, you know... And like, oh, this is the worst thing that could have possibly happened to any human. And like, that's not true. And look, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination downplaying, you know, uh, the bad things that happen in life. And I'm including illness. I'm including, you know, uh, being mistreated by others. I'm including all those things. Everything that happens in the fallen world, I'm including that. But yet, in the right perspective... And the right perspective, when you say, okay, all these things, but yet Christ, they, they don't compare. I shared with uh, Gabby the other day, you know, w one, of the, one of the greatest challenges that, that, um, that, that I've personally been experiencing, and I thank the Lord for this, one of the personal challenges I've been experiencing being a chaplain is is, is, is dealing with uh, just with all the brokenness. There's so much brokenness out there. And it's all 
it all comes down to relationships, right? All comes down to relationships. And even though there's a lot of brokenness, that isn't really the biggest challenge that I experienced. I share with it that the biggest challenge that I came or that I'm, that I'm having is the fact that I have absolutely nothing to complain about. And I say that not in a boastful manner, but in a, in a manner that God's been so good, so good to me, to my family, and He is amazingly good that it's difficult to find something to say, I have something to complain about. I have absolutely nothing to complain about. And yeah, I got challenges in life. I got physical stuff that I'm going through, but you know what? It's nothing. It's nothing com when I compare it to Christ and His goodness and His love for me. And all that, all that He's done in my life. And like I said, when I, when I, comp when I see, when I hear the brokenness, and and the and the voices, you know, the voices that that you know reverberate in my heart and my mind, especially when tragedy strikes. It's just heartbreaking, man. That that all of a sudden, if I start to try to even complain about this, that God reminds me, oh no, you don't know brokenness. You don't know brokenness, and yet God has been so gracious to just show me the depth of brokenness of so many people that is just beautiful and eloquently has placed me in a place where I have absolutely nothing to complain about. Nothing. And it brings me to the point instead of just saying, you know, my own heart, if it wasn't for the Lord. Because that's the difference. You take out the Lord in my life, oh, believe me, I, I'm in the... I'm right there in the group of the broken, man. Broken, distraught, empty, lost, you know, without hope, and, and, and my world caving in and collapsing upon me. But if it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't be where I'm at. I wouldn't be able to properly assess and really evaluate properly and say, man, God is good, man. And on top of Him being good, He blesses with gifts and He gives us opportunities and he, and he desires to use us. And not only desires, but does when we make ourselves available. I mean, this is like crazy stuff. <coughs> and yet, we get caught up. We get so easily caught up. And so, my prayer is, is that we don't. <laughs> we evaluate properly. And even if it's from the examples of Paul's life himself, to even say, thank you, Lord, for Paul. Thank you for the example of his life and all that he went through. Thank you for the saints of old, all that they went through so that your beautiful gospel could reach my ears and my heart so that I could experience your beauty, your excellency, your grace. And if I don't experience anything else beyond that, I have everything nonetheless. I have everything nonetheless. Because everything else beyond that is just icing on the cake. That's all it is. Even the sufferings. That's icing on the cake. The sufferings in Christ Jesus for Christ's sake, that is icing on the cake, man. Because prior to that, you're suffering in vain. <laughs> you're just suffering in vain, man. Who wants to suffer in vain? I want to suffer with purpose. And let it be for the purpose of Christ's sake, amen? Let's pray. Father God.